Thank you, Kristen. Um, just before I get started, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them at any time. So I'm not offended at all. Just shout them out um, when they come up. So basically, I part of my research agenda is working on mathematics education. And as Kristen referenced, my mom does a lot in math. So as much as I tried to avoid doing math, because when you spend an entire summer folding fraction strips because she makes you for a book <laughs> she's writing, you try to want to get out of this. But I kept being sucked back in. And so um, a portion of my research is focused on mathematics education. And a lot at the secondary level, although one of the studies I'm going to talk to you today about involves elementary students. But this is just kind of an overview of where my research in mathematics education involves. So some of my research looks at curriculum and uh, the tiers. So if you guys are familiar with the RTI, looking at RTI in mathematics education at the secondary level. But a lot of my research involves technology. And so looking at how different forms of technology support mathematics education for students with disabilities. And so some of the work has looked at how calculators are in a, can be a valid assessment accommodation for students with disabilities, um, manipulatives and how they can support understanding and, and access to mathematics, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Looking at how students with um, disabilities can access algebra via digital text. And then finally looking at some functional math for our students with more moderate um, intellectual disability, how we can use technology to access their functional math skills to make them more independent in their daily living. All right, so today I'm going to talk about why, very briefly, why manipulatives, why my interest in manipulatives, why I spend my time researching it, uh, two previous studies that I have done looking at concrete and virtual manipulatives, and then some of the current studies that we're collecting data on right now involving concrete and virtual manipulatives. So this is just kind of a, a placeholder to kind of talk about why manipulatives. This is actually a table from a systematic review on conducting right now on the manipulative instruction. So one of the things that we talk about in math education for students with disabilities a lot is the idea that manipulatives are um, research-based, they're best practice. We should be using them with students with disabilities. And so I've conducted, con conducting a systematic review to understand what do we know about manipulative instruction for students with disabilities, and is it an evidence-based practice by applying the quality indicators in our field to the type of research done on this to say, do these studies actually have the quality indicators in the, sing in the field of single subject research, which most of the studies involve single subject. And I'll kind of explain that when I get into my research. Are there, can we talk about manipulative instruction as being an evidence-based practice for students with disabilities because these studies meet the quality indicators and we have a sufficient number? And so, but the point is why manipulatives? Um, I think that manipulatives are a great avenue for our students with disabilities because they're being used in the general education classroom. We want students with disabilities to have access to the general education classroom, and so they need access and support from the same tools that are being supported and used in those settings. Secondly, um, manipulatives to me are a much better alternative than some of the practices that we unfortunately advocate in special ed. The number of interns I talk to right now who say their mentor or teachers are having them teach touch math just you know, it, it infuriates me. And I don't know if you're familiar with touch math. Um. <laughs> I found out recently that I was taught using touch math, but I didn't know it until I was talking about how I used to count and stuff. I, for the life of me, cannot figure out how to do it. Like, <laughs> There are more than six dots on that six. And I've had a little student tell me, and I'm like, I don't understand it. But it's all about counting, counting these dots and reforming their numbers. To me, that's not really developing very much conceptual understanding. And, and the students get so hung up on memorizing what dots they're counting that we're not really getting at the bigger mathematics pictures. And so to me, if we can provide that instruction with manipulatives, and then through the process that we do have some good research support, move them down into that abstract level of understanding that that's a more appropriate means than some of the alternatives that we're advocating. And I talk about the moving them from concrete to abstract because that is one of the areas that is talked about um, as a research supported for students with disabilities and is advocated as both a tier two and tier three instructional approach in mathematics um, is that concrete representational abstract approach or the CRA approach in which we teach students to use the concrete to do the representational which is the drawing and then to move on to be hopefully being able to solve problems abstractly without needing to draw or have the physical um, manipulatives to maneuver. All right. Any questions so far? All right. And so I'm going to talk about my first study. So my first study, as I said, most of my research involves secondary students. But this was an opportunity that I worked with some colleagues, and we were working with elementary age students with autism. And actually, and these particular students were not in a general education setting. They were all educated in an autism clinic. 
which we see increasingly happening for our students with autism. And a lot of the problem with our education right now and our focus on students with autism is we focus very heavily on behavior and not enough content. And so if you look in the research, there's very little research that talks about academic content instruction for students with autism, and even less in mathematics. Right? So in special ed in general, we don't have as much attention to mathematics as we do to reading or even writing. It is kind of like starting to get there, but really not the level of attention to literacy. And for students with autism, outside of touch math, there's no research that talks about how we can support these students' access to content area learning in mathematics. And so we felt it was important to think, can we use these tools? Can we use concrete manipulatives? And in, conversely, can we also use virtual manipulatives to get these students to understand the mathematics at where they're at? And so we were actually doing a comparison of how they are doing in terms of solving mathematics at their level using concrete versus virtual manipulatives. Um, you guys familiar with it? We use, sorry, we use the virtual manipulatives from the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. Is everyone familiar with that? I'm just going to show a brief clip because when I talk about what the students, what their social validity, what they talked about it, it will make sense if you see this very clip. So this is kind of using, we were doing subtraction. For two of the students, we were doing single subject and one double, um, double digit, sorry, single digit subtraction and double digit. And it was all based on their key math assessment. So we gave them a key math assessment to determine their level um, and where they were working at. And this is, so one of them was double digit and two of them were doing single digit subtraction. And so this is just a video of what it was like, what they saw in terms of using it, except for the fact that we had this covered up. So they could not actually see the answer. All right. So I mentioned this study was a single subject alternating treatment design. Um, single subject research, I don't know if you guys how familiar people are with the concept of single subject research. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so single subject research is very... Um, popular, it's used a lot in special education, and it's used when you have a smaller population, which is often students with disabilities, and in particularly um, some populations such as students with autism. It is experimental design, um, and it's not, it's mis, I think it's a little interesting in the name, it's not that we have an N of one. You are looking at each individual as their single case, but you have to have that replication over a minimum of three cases. And so typically, that means you have to have a minimum of three students to actually have a valid single subject design. And so there's ty different types of single subject research. This one here is an alternating treatment design. The next one I'm going to talk about is a multiple baseline. And it's just that the studies are set up differently. It's all similar in the sense that they have an idea we have phases. So many of them have a baseline phase, an intervention phase, some maintenance, and or generalization. But what happens during the intervention, or when the intervention is introduced, differs by the type of single subject design you're using. And so this one was an alternating treatment, and so as it sounds, we literally alternated the treatment during intervention. So the independent variable was the manipulatives, and the two conditions were the virtual and the concrete. And so it was alternated mm -hmm. in a random order with no more than two conditions of this, no more than two sessions back to back of the same condition. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just drawing them out of a hat, um, for each student and they're rapidly alternating their conditions during intervention. And so um, in baseline, which is typical of single subject, we're just asking them to solve their sub subtraction problems, whether single digit or double digit. And then we go into a training phase where we're teaching them how to use each type of manipulatives, um, how to use the concrete, how to use the virtual, and then doing the intervention where we are collecting data using the same assessments as during baseline, but when they're getting access to the concrete and virtual manipulatives. Um, and then in this particular one, because we're all doing an alternating treatment, alternating treatment, we have a best treatment. So we're trying to parse out, is the treatment in which is best, the intervention condition in which is best, can they maintain that when they're just receiving that intervention? And then we looked for generalization. So do these um, skills generalize? Okay, so the generalization can be to different settings, obviously, depending on the type of instruction, different types of problems. So we could have gone to addition, we um, could have gone to word problems. We actually tried to make it very, um, as functional as possible. Um, and so for the students, uh, for the concrete manipulatives, we actually looked to do a token economy. So they'd actually have to exchange in actual tokens to get a reward, because they did that frequently. So we were trying to connect the idea of this mathematics to what they were typically doing with a token economy of being able to exchange tokens for a reward. Um, the, and the virtual is a little more challenging. Um, I couldn't necessarily find a real world, so we had them set up the problems themselves. So if you went back to the video, we would set up the blocks for them, and then they would have to manipulate them to find the answer. 
in the generalization, they actually had to set up all the blocks for themselves. Um, in single subject research, we are really doing a lot, our data analysis involves visual analysis. So it's very heavily on graphs. So you're graphing the data and then you're looking for different um, aspects. So one of them is the idea that we're looking for trends. And we can do mathematical calculations on this, but a lot of it's that visual analysis. And we're looking at, I'll put up a graph so I can kind of talk about this. We're looking at trends both within phases. So I'm looking at, is there a trend here in my intervention and between phases? And I want to talk about accelerating, decelerating, or zero acceleration trends. And when we're in baseline, we don't want accelerating trends. And in intervention, we want accelerating or zero acceleration. We wouldn't want our students to do worse in intervention. We also look at stability, and we really want to have the data stable. And so we talk about stability as about 80% of our data falls within 20% of the median or, or mean. And so we want stability in both baseline before we go into intervention, as well as an intervention. We want that data to be stable. We also have measures of effect size. And so we're looking at, sometimes we're looking at the percent of non-overlapping data. So does the data, data overlap? And we don't want that. Um, and there's other measures that basically say, does this effect work? And also then, is one here more effective than the other by comparing the data points that overlap? Um, and so finally, we just look for immediacy. And so you can see here, the immediacy is what happens when you go from baseline to intervention. And you can see here, we have a very clear immediate effect. You're at zero, and you go to 100%. That's an immediate effect. So we talk about the immediacy of the effect between the last two data points in a phase. And so this is the results of our study. As I mentioned, we have three students. They were all elementary age, although they weren't in general education. They were six, seven, and 10 and they were working at a kindergarten or first grade level, and again, two of them in single digit subtraction and one of them in double digit. And these were students who were getting no mathematics instruction and hadn't been getting it for the entire year before. So they're not students who are accessing. And so what you can see here is Hugo. This was both concrete, so the darker one is concrete, the lighter one is virtual. He's not doing well in um, terms of baseline inaccuracy. And yet, as soon as we had the instruction and he has access to the manipulatives, which they use, they all use both manipulatives to solve all the problems, he goes to 100% and is relatively able to maintain it during the maintenance or best treatment, as well as generalization. As I mentioned, for students with autism, accuracy is important, but so is independence. Often our students with autism and students with disabilities in general are prompt dependent. I don't know if any of you have worked with students with autism before. I'm working with a little boy right now and <laughs> we are talking about prompt dependent. Like I am constantly having to prompt him to do everything and that's very common. It's his paraprofessional too. But we want our students to become more independent. And so we recorded that independent data. And how independent are they? And that basically means in, in converse, how, you know, do, how few prompts do we have to give? And so we obviously want to give as few as prompts as, as we can and to be as independent as possible. And we do this a lot by doing a task analysis. And I'll show an example of a task analysis in my current study where we break down the components of the math we're trying to do and we look about at each of these steps, do they need prompting? And we often use what's known as a system of least prompts. Um, and so we actually work up into prompting them to greater involvement. And so beginning our prompts are just gesturing. So the little boy I'm working with right now, I'm just gesturing to the paper of what he has to do. And if he fails to respond with that within a set amount of time, and then I'm giving an indirect prompt. And that's the same procedure as we did here. And I might say, what's next, or your turn. Um, he fails to respond to that, then I might give a very much direct prompt. Answer the problem, read the problem, <laughs> write the problem. Um, and that, if he doesn't do that, then we go into modeling. And so I'm actually modeling to him what it looks like to configure, um, to set up the blocks with the tens and the ones. Um, and then sometimes, which we never had to do with these students, we have to get into that partial physical assistance or full physical assistance. We, haven't, we didn't have to do that in this study, but working with some of my high school students with moderate intellectual disability and price comparison, we had to do full physical assistance where we're moving them to the grocery store to the right aisle and we're directing them to the right thing so they can do the price comparison in an actual setting. But we didn't have to do that here. And so you can see, as I mentioned, immediacy effect with accuracy as well as independence. He went from pretty low levels of independence to doing pretty high levels of independence and we're able to maintain 
that high. That means he's not needing um, us, he's not needing anyone there to prompt him on how to do the mathematics. He's, he's needing very few prompts to be able to use the tools and to be able then to, as we see, successfully answer the questions. So I have a question yeah. about your participants yeah. because you're saying that they're ASD mm -hmm. and that is a really big spectrum. So can you say a little bit more about these participants? Were they, you know, in terms of cognitive functioning, were they in different places on the spectrum or? Yeah, yeah so most of them would be in the average to, to lower. Okay. And I mean, so we're not talking about students who had um, moderate, severe intellectual disability. Okay. One, our 10-year-old who was operating at about a first grade, a uh, kindergarten level, he may have been the closest to having a mild or closer to that 70, 75 IQ. Okay. Um, but the other two, I mean, six and seven, and they were operating at a kindergarten and a first grade math level. So you're talking about students with average in, um, intelligence, but who um, weren't getting access to academics. And so I think that's the big issue. Yeah. You're talking about students who if they were in a general education setting, would be actually expected to be participating in general education curriculum and can clearly, I mean, <laughs> we are, it was our first grader, our seven-year-old, who was doing double-digit subtraction, right? And so that's operating at, you know, um, grade level. Well, my son's in second grade. That's what yeah. they're spending all that time on. And he was able to successfully do it with his tools. So, sorry, yeah. good point that these are students who are of average um, intellect and ability. Yeah, I just wanted ability. to make, it wasn't, they weren't like, they didn't have Asperger's or something. No, I they had, would be no, they had a yeah. um, okay. true, so on that, we did the autism scale and the, they had true autism on the autism scale. Okay. Um, but they just didn't have the um, comorbid intellectual disability with the autism. Okay, okay. Yeah. What's the time duration for Sorry, the, the data that we're looking at? So we're doing this across weeks. So we do one to two sessions a day. And so um, it's across a semester usually is what it lasts, it's an academic semester. So we're with them for a period of weeks. Um, it just depends. This one, was we were able to work with them more frequently because they weren't in a general education classroom or weren't in a school. So we didn't have to, if you work in a school, sometimes the teachers are like, you can come out one day or <laughs> a week. And so the study takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. We were actually working with them four or five days a week because they were in an autism clinic. So it really shortened down the time frame of the study. So mm -hmm. is all the baseline chunked at the beginning and then all oh, the Yeah, so that is our, the sessions go in order. So yeah, so you see, you know, this is probably done across, we did this across two weeks and then we did this across, you know, the next three to four weeks, um, coming back the five, six weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was a truncated experience because we were able to meet with them more frequently than we do perhaps if they're in a general ed setting. Um, you can say the same thing with the other two students. So this is just, I just put up a table. We often import tables of averages, um, but to us they mean less than some of the visuals. So you can kind of see the averages and see the success across the different phases for each of the students for the different intervention conditions. But you can also see the, the graph and that idea that Accuracy, we're going to be accurate. And in terms of independence, he was very independent with the virtual. And this was one of the things that we found consistently across the students, is that they were more independent with the virtual manipulatives and the concrete. But we do have, again, the nice accelerating or zero acceleration trends, which we want. And generally, ability to maintain. Although with the virtual, <laughs> our students struggle to set up the problems. And so we saw that across the three students, the struggle to set up the problems themselves with the um, computer. And again, the same thing here. So again, the student had a little more success, but again, we see increases. There's no app overlapping data between baseline and intervention is what we want. And we see that accelerating or zero acceleration trend depending on independence and accuracy. Um, and so to us, this represented positive data. And so some of the things that we took away was that really we can use concrete or virtual manipulatives to support. Um, the virtual manipulatives were actually more effective with the independence and a lot of that is because the students like them. They were fascinated with the blocks separating out the visual. So that brief video I showed, how it showed when we move the tens blocks to the one and it separates out, they loved that. That was very engaging. That visual stimulation was very engaging to them. They really enjoyed it. So they were much more on point um, with independence, less prompting with the visual. It, was, it, in, it fell into their skills. It fell into their interests. Um, so they really liked it. Um, one of the things that we liked was that the virtual was free, but one of the challenges is that it's computer-based. Mm -hmm. you know, so I love the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. Like I warn my students, like you will get, you know, you'll just stay on this forever. It's so much fun. I promise. Like this is fun stuff. 
Um, but it's limited to computers. It's Java-based. So we can't put, you know, it's not that it doesn't work on the iPads. And we're increasingly seeing that used in schools for students with autism in special ed in general. We'll see what teachers would tell us, yeah, I don't have, I have one computer, or I don't have the computer lab, but I got a classroom set of iPads. You can do something with that. And so we can't use the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. So we're thinking about what other means can we do to try to think about harm, you know, harnessing some of that interest and that um, greater independence that we saw with the virtual manipulatives, but doing it in a more app-based form. So any questions about this study? Yes, Missy. The generalization phase, that was without the virtual manipulatives, or that was just without? They still have them, but um, they had to set up the virtual manipulatives themselves. Mm -hmm. So. So like if we were to set up this problem for them, they had to, like, so if it was um, 28 minus 19, they actually had to bring down the blocks themselves and set it up. Okay. So there's no phase where there's subtraction without anything? There isn't. The, um, in single step, so that, if we were to do that, that would have been an adapted alternating treatment design. Okay. Um, and we could have done that. So you see an adaptive alternating treatment design they often then will continue the baseline phase throughout this. Mm -hmm. um, we did not do that. That's just a different design, so we could have. And so that's definitely interesting for future research is to bring in that um, continuing baseline and intervention to see if what you're doing, the manipulatives, actually have an effect that what you would want it to do and to be able to do it without. Transfer at that point. Yes. Okay. Yes. And you could have done that with the generalization phase as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you tell me what the y-axis are on those two graphs? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So this is, the top one is accuracy and the bottom is independence. So accuracy in the Solving. answer? Solving, yes. Like, are they getting the answer correct? Okay. And, and the independence was measured by, I know you said it. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. It was the prompting. So independence was okay. the number of steps in the task analysis in which you didn't need prompting. Huh. So if there is 10 steps in the prompt analysis across in each question, so if there's, you know, five questions, there's 50, you know, your denominator is 50. How many times of that did you need prompting or did in an independence did not need prompting? So is it, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so did that answer I, your I question? Knew, I knew you said it, I just have forgotten. No, I apologize. I talk fast. I'm very sorry. Just wave at me. All right. Any other, yeah. No, I'm you're going to wave at me? Do. I, I, my undergrads, they start throwing things at me. I'm like, let me know. Um, so I'm going to transition to the second study. And so this was done with a graduate student. Uh, he was a former math teacher. And when he worked with me on the first study, he became really interested in the virtual manipulatives and wanted to take them on to the secondary level. And so we conducted a study looking at area and perimeter with the virtual manipulatives, the tiles. Um, they have a much formal math name, but I cannot pronounce that very well. So I'm just going to call them tiles. Um, I, yeah. Um, and looking at area and perimeter. And so he, we were working with students who would learn this was pretty severe learning disabilities and had not mastered. They were, had low math skills. Their teacher indicated that they continued to struggle. In fact, these were students who were not passing in the state. They had to pass a test to be able to get your diploma. They weren't passing that test. And so the end of the year assessment, they're not passing. So they were, had big struggles. Um, this was also a single subject design, as I mentioned, very popular in special ed. Um, but we did a multiple baseline. So it's a different type of single subject design in the sense that multiple baseline means that we're going to stagger when we start the intervention. So we again are working with three students, but and we're not, we only have one intervention condition and we're going to stagger when we start that. So we can kind of look at that functional relationship. Similar to the other study, um, we had the phases of baseline. We had training and instruction. So we trained them, um, provided instruction on both how to use the virtual manipulus as well as the concepts of area and perimeter, right? Because um, as we thought was important for all this research, it's not that the tools are just tools, but they need to be used with good instruction. So it's, we can't just give the kids the tools but not give the mathematics instruction with it. So that was that instruction and training was both on area and perimeter as well as in how to use this particular tool to help them to understand area and perimeter. Um, we looked at both area and perimeter questions, so they answered those in, assessment, in intervention and baseline. And then we had maintenance, and the generalization this time was actually to abstract word problems. Um, and so this is just some of the examples. We had regular, irregular and regular shapes that we use for the assessments in looking at area and perimeter. So again, three students. Um, yeah, these graphs are very solved. This is, this, all this is the same one. This is correctly solved problem. So this is just accuracy. 
stated differently. So we worked with three students. Um, this was very nice baseline data and what you want in the sense that they did not do well doing baseline. They, high school students, but did not have any concept of being able to solve area and perimeter problems on their own. Um, and we see that. And yet you see, again, some positive interventions, particularly for Xavier. I mean, he was like the poster child for single subject design research. You're like, this is what I want all my studies to look like. He went from zero to 100%, was able to maintain it, was able to generalize it. The instruction, and he, and again, same thing with this last study, they consistently used the tool. So it wasn't like we taught them and they didn't use the tool. They, they used the manipulatives. He used the virtual manipulatives to help him solve it. But yes, he was able, he understood it, used the tool successfully, and was able to maintain and even apply it to the word problems, that generalization phase. Um, you know, Mark, uh, we had, again, not that overlap in data. We had some variability, um, particularly with in the area and perimeter. You can see that the area is a little triangle. It's hard to see. The perimeter is kind of the open rectangle. Um, and he struggled with maintenance and, again, with generalization. We found that in intervention, students tended to perform better with area. But for some reason, during generalization and even maintenance, um, they tended to do better with perimeter. So that was an interesting finding. We then had Jake that was quite variable. So he didn't have any of that overlapping data. Um, and we see some accelerating trends, but we see some problems with the maintenance and problems with the generalization, which if I was a teacher would go back and try to go back and think, I could use this to go back and think, I need to provide additional instruction. Where is the area? Is he struggling? Um, and so one of the things that we talked about here was that they increased their performance in area improvement. They did. So they had no instruction. We provided the instruction. We gave them the tool, and they were more successful. As you mentioned, they did perform better with area. But then again, when we get into maintenance and generalization, they switched to the per, um, perform better on the perimeter. They actually liked the virtual manipulatives. And so I put up an image of why they liked them. Because in single subject research, we also do social validity. And so a lot of times we're um, talking to the students and the teachers uh, to make sure that the interventions are valid, socially valid. Like, are these actually worthwhile? We didn't just find data, but there's actually some social validity to what we're doing. And the students repeatedly talked about liking to be able to change the colors. And so if you're familiar with this um, National Library of Virtual Manipulatives one, you can change the colors of the tiles. And so they liked that because they said it really helped them to see perimeter, it helped them to see area. And so that was one of the features that they said that, that they preferred the virtual manipulatives and particularly highlighted their ability to change the colors of the blocks as one of the reasons that they would prefer to continue to use this particular um, manipulative. Um, and we also, again, the point I made early on, that it's not just tools, all the technology they're just tools, but they, you know, we need to use them with good instruction, and so we need to pre as give, provide them to students as tools, but realize that they need that instruction and support. Mm -hmm. um, he continued um, studying virtual manipulatives, and his dissertation um, was actually comparing virtual and concrete algebraic balance scales. <laughs> <laughs> with um, secondary students with learning disabilities. Um, and I bring this up not to talk about it, but one of the points that came up was how the students all wanted to use the virtual algebraic balance scales. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this. You know, I, I mean, how many of you guys have used a concrete virtual an algebraic balance scale lately? They're really cum cumbersome, um, the thing around. But one of the things the students said to us is, this helped me, but I would, both of them helped me, but I'm not using that. I'm not using that concrete one because I'm not going to do that in front of my peers in class. But if I'm, you know, if I'm on a computer, if people aren't looking what I'm doing, I could use this. Help me understand algebra. But nobody is noticing that I'm doing this. Whereas none of my peers are using that algebraic balance scale. So if I get that out to help me, they're all going to, know that I'm using that. And so that's one of the things with technology, and particularly as our students get older and that becomes more of an issue, that stigmatization or that not wanting to stand out, um, that peer acceptance and things like that. That's where some of the app-based or the online tools can support our students because it wouldn't be as drawing as much attention to them um, as perhaps um, using the concrete. And again, that algebraic balance scale is quite cumbersome with, um, to manipulate and to definitely would draw attention to you. I'm curious, this study is different than your previous one in that your participants had had prior instruction in mm -hmm. finding area and perimeter. Oh, yeah. So how do you think your findings, your results, it, do you feel like there was maybe some interference from the prior knowledge they had if they had maybe just 
memorize formulas and then they were trying to apply those formulas or something like that um, as they were using the manipulatives? Did, did that come out in their description of what they were doing? No, I mean, they, we, um, yeah, so they had very, they were taught this, but they did not bring it with us, them into, I mean, we did pre-assessments on them prior to do, even doing baseline, and these students, for some whatever reason, had this instruction, I mean, we know in theory they're getting this instruction in um, lower grades, but they, it did not, wasn't in there, they did, weren't even trying to apply formulas, you know, um, can you tell me what area means, I mean, they, nope, they weren't telling us formulas, they, mm, okay. They were physically perhaps in a class, but they were not getting anything, yeah. um, which is problematic. I mean, I think it's a good point. I just worked with, sat down with some middle school students who, again, looking at the standards, I know you would have been exposed to area and perimeter, and I say, can you tell me what area is? Just last week, and they go, huh? I don't know what area is. And I'm like, I know you have had this. I haven't had this, lady, like, uh. you're nuts. <laughs> um, so for whatever reason, these particular students, no, they, had, um, were not applying that formula. They weren't just trying to do memorization. They really had no concept of being able to articulate area okay. and perimeter and to be able to um, solve the problems or to understand. I mean, it, um, the instruction we did, I mean, we talked about going back, you know, this is, what is area and walking, you know, talking about this is a space in the room, perimeter, walking around the room to bringing it down to the actual problems. So we spent some good time actually providing that instruction on area and perimeter. Um, and then seeing their success with that instruction, with the manipulatives, of course, also can ca cause questions about um, what is actually happening so perhaps in some of our special education math classes. <laughs> if these students are in our special education math classes, which typically happen, um, they tend to get into those tracks more in middle school and continue into high school. I think we have in special education some huge gaps that we're trying to work on in making sure our special education teachers are knowledgeable about mathematics and can actually teach mathematics. Um, you know, we're, we've made some strides. I mean, it used to be you'd go into a high school math classroom and you'd have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and they're still doing worksheets of all your basic operations. Because the teachers would say to me, well, they haven't learned those yet. So we're just going to keep doing that till they learn them. <laughs> and as I tell my interns, like, I would hate math too if I'm sitting there and it's 10, 11 years into my career and I'm still asking to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division because quote unquote, I haven't mastered it rather than giving me a calculator and then letting me access some higher level mathematics such as area and perimeter, such as um, you know getting into algebra again with the use of the calculator. Um, so I think we do have some challenges of how we prepare our special education teachers to support math and the instruction that's occurring in those settings. And I think this is clearly evident of some of that problems. Mm. AJ? So for a perimeter, mm -hmm. um, which is the top graph, I think, you said that this was kind of like the poster kind of designed for this it because it was really this, high. This is area and perimeter, yeah, combined together. Oh, okay. So at the end, did you return to that question about like how they described what perimeter was at the end? We didn't, but I think that would be interesting mm -hmm. for next time. Mm -hmm. We didn't, but that would be a good point to go back. Because the generalization is just, my understanding, it's the same kind of task. Are they able to continue performing on the task? No, the generalization here was word prompts. So we, instead of just giving them the shapes, you know, and asking them to calculate area and perimeter, we actually gave them word problems that they had to then um, pull out the information to be able to solve the area and perimeter. Okay. So it was a little more complex. Yeah. This particular generalization was that ideal word problems. But I think it would be interesting to go back and, and talk to them. Yeah. And if I'm correct, there was no prompting in this thing, right? No prompting. Okay. No. Again, um, students with learning disabilities, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we tried to gather prompting data, but there was nothing to prompt <laughs> them on. And um, in working with some of the students now, that's pretty consistent, is that there's not that prompting, so there's no use kind of recording that, or rep there's no use saying that if it's 100% during independence, during baseline and intervention. All right. Um, any other questions? Okay. And so what I'm continuing right now is I'm working with um, some school districts and some teachers and students and continuing to explore this. And so one of the things we're looking at is the use of concrete and moving into app-based manipulatives and looking at this for both elementary students with autism as well as then some middle school students with learning disabilities. And finally, um, one of our interests, in, and I say we um, my graduate student and I have worked on, on these previous projects together, is 
We're really interested in the CRA approach, that concrete representational abstract, but our question really is, where does virtual manipulatives fall into that CRA approach? Can the virtual manipulatives replace the concrete and it's really been more like an, a VRA? Or is it a step in between you know, C and R? Or is it actually replace the representational? We don't really know, and that's one of the reasons comparing concrete to virtual is if you can say we can get equivalent findings with these, they can be equivalent success with concrete and virtual, then in theory we could replace the concrete with the virtual, um, which for some of our older students would be less stigmatizing, again, when you get into that middle school mm -hmm. and high school. Um, my middle school kids are not thrilled if we're in any public place to get out the, con the base 10 block. <laughs> if I'm in the conference room and behind the office and it's, you know, just us, they're great. But in the library, they're giving me looks like I lady, I'm not quite comfortable, mm -hmm. um, versus that app-based or virtual, and then providing that support. And so that's kind of one of the areas that we're going. But as I mentioned, so we're looking at the CRA approach to money, and this is, um, we're working with middle school students with intellectual disabilities, and we're really interested in trying to increase their independence, and so we're looking at making change, and we want to be able to move them from that idea of I have physical, you know, that fake money, to that being able to draw, to being able that I can do this on my own so that I would know how much I'm supposed to get back and not have to perhaps count it out in front of the cashier or, or ask them to count it out for me so that I'm that much more independent, I'm that much more of a consumer, a Suave you know, consumer, and that I can be independent in my purchasing and my, um, in my daily livings. Um, so do I still, can I keep going? Am I good on time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, we'll want to make sure to stop just yes. a little bit early, but you've got time. Okay, all right. So I'll just, these are very brief. So this is again is similar to the um, this particular stu two studies, one with elementary students with autism, the other secondary students with learning disabilities. It's similar in the sense the one that we did with elementary students with looking at the National Library vir virtual manipulatives and base ten blocks, but we're using an app. Um, so base ten. Oh, on the iPad we put a little sticky thing on here, but um, it doesn't let me do that when I do screenshots. Um, and we're trying to compare again the app base versus the concrete. Um, because see if they can be equally supported. So with the elementary students with autism, we're actually working on word problems and the students are testing in the double digit edition, so they're upper elementary students. Um, my students, with, my middle school students with learning disabilities, um, they are lower and so they're testing in the double digit and triple digit subtraction area. And so um, uh, yesterday, or yes, yesterday I called my mom as I was leaving the school system and I was like, she goes, how was your day? And I said, I think I need to hit my head against the wall because I spent 50 minutes with this lovely little middle school student and we're trying to provide that training and instruction on the base 10 and I'm, you know, and I know the teacher has been using base 10. I've seen him in her classroom, like this is, so triple digit subtraction is nothing new for this young gentleman. And I'm modeling how I would set up the base 10 block so then I'm going to model train on the concrete so we can go to the app base, which is a new introduction. And, um, I set it up and I'm setting up my hundreds and my tens and my ones and I have two different colors because the app is two different colors so I'm like, see, two different colors, ba you know, concrete base hand and I said every time he goes to do it he sets up his hundreds, tens, ones and he mixes up all the colors and, <laughs> um, and he sets up the bottom, the, top, the bottom number on top of the top number and I said it doesn't I said, we spent 45 minutes of me modeling what to do, and repeatedly he's going back to that same thing. And yet, when I ask him to do, you know, double uh, things, he can do double digit subtraction and addition completely independently. But for some reason, we get to this triple, and he can't even set up the problem, that conceptual understanding of what it is, what is the hundreds, and the tens, and the ones, and what does it mean to ungroup, um, and things like that. And so, I said, I just, I said, I think I just needed to hit my head against the wall today. I, um, so, so this is, I just have a quick um, video. I was very excited because I taught myself how to make um, a screen capture after my, off my iPad last night, so it was very exciting. Um, so I just, this is what this particular app looks like. Um, and again, it's covered up, but if you want it, similar to the National Library, but if you're not familiar with this app, this is what it looks like to do um, addition. So we're working with the young gentlemen um, here to do um, word prompts, so they're having to read the prompt, and they all can, they can read our elementary kids, and then they're asking to be able to set up the prom and then be able to solve them. And he is the um, one that's starting the intervention. He is big into technology, so this is again right up his alley. And so 
this is something that is appealing to our students is um, that visual. Again, they like that visual nature of seeing them click together or in subtraction see them kind of click apart. Um, so just a quick video. This is what it looks like with subtraction. So again, they are actually aren't seeing the answers, but this is what it looks like for them to use the apps. And he, yes, the young gentleman who has spoken um, in intervention, he's actually much better at this than I am. This is me multiple attempts to make the video look good. <laughs> he could do it in about two seconds. <laughs> so he is much better on the iPad even than I am. So you can just see the visual. I won't make you do the whole thing. But that's in general what it does. So it has that visual representation. Um, this is again similar design in terms of an alternating treatment. But it, to get to Missy's question, our generalization is going to go back to the idea, can you generalize this now to without the tools and things like that. So that's what we're looking at as um, being able to compare these two, seeing then are they able to understand with the concrete and virtual manipulatives, and then are they able to apply it without the tools, which is what we would ideally want to be able to see if this has some transfer. Um, as I mentioned, the prompting. So with the elementary students, we're dealing a lot with autism and dealing a lot with prompting. We're hoping that we are gathering the data for our middle school students with learning disabilities, but we're hoping not to use it. But as I mentioned, the young gentleman who I spent all <laughs> yesterday with not being able to set the problem up, we don't put them in intervention until they can have 80% success in a training session. So basically, they'd have mm -hmm. to answer four out of five questions completely independently to be able to move on, showing us that they have learned. Um, but we are going to continue to gather that um, prompting data because of the concerns with um, being that independent. So this is just an example of our data recording sheet. But what it is is a task analysis. So when I say collecting prompting data, we break down everything they need to do into these component steps. And then we're recording the data about if they're correct and then the level of prompting that they need. So we can talk about the amount of prompting they receive as well as the level of prompting that students receive. And hopefully that our level of prompting would decrease. Um, and by levels I mean having to do modeling versus direct versus gestures. And it's, as well as that their amount of prompting decreases. And so those are just some examples of some different task analysis that we've done for both the double digit word problem addition, which is a little bit more complex because you have to read the problem and then write down the numbers versus just computational problems. And then the more complex triple digit su um, subtraction. Um, and then the other current study that we're doing, as I mentioned, is we're looking at concrete representational abstract with money and we're working with students with intellectual disability to gain the goal to move them from that lovely fake money to the drawings to hopefully being able to do this independently. And this is, we're doing a, a single subject design, multiple baseline. So again, we're going to have staggered um, interventions and we're working with these students. So we all um, pre-assessed them and they all could identify coins. That was a big thing, right? We can't worry about <laughs> can you make change if you can do coins. And they were also able to um, add some money, but they weren't able to make change. So we did a lot of pre-assessments to make sure we were hitting that target um, functional math level. So you could identify coins, they could do some adding, but they couldn't make change. So if I said, you know, my, um, we're putting them in word problems, so, and they love to have their names in them. Noah went to the store and bought a Gatorade for, a Gatorade for $1.29, he gave the cashier $2. How much change did he get back? And so these are very functional. You could actually, you know, these students are spending money, they're going to be engaging that increasingly as they continue to move from middle school to high school. And so what we did is did all the pre-assessments to determine this is where they're at and this is where they all struggle, but they have the precursor skills needed. And so we're teaching them about that counting up. And so we're working with them on baseline. We've just started our first student into the concrete manipulative intervention. And again, we're gonna, when she has 80% correct across a minimum of three sessions using concrete, which is where we physically have the fake money and she's able to solve those problems. Then she goes to the representational and the second student enters the concrete. And so we're gonna have a staggered mm -hmm. um, graph. So they have to have 80% correct across three sessions. And each time they have to have 80% correct in each session or we repeat it. So we're looking to that again, that not just for research, we want them to understand. So if you need more in concrete, it's not that you have 
you have a minimum of three, but we'll give you more or if you need more on representational. And our ultimate goal is to move these students into that abstract so they can become as independent as possible in their daily lives with regards to making change and being able to purchase things um, and, and everything like that. So, so yes, so those are, in the interest of time, those were just some, the current studies that we're collecting, but if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Yes, AJ. So in the app, one of the things that I noticed when you played the video was that when you had 10 of the individual things come together, it automatically formed the, the grouping. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine probably in the, in the concrete that that feature isn't really there. Right, you, they have to do the physical exchange themselves. So uh, did you find that, that that feature of the virtual app may have contributed to perhaps differences that you found in the two sets of data? Well, we're just starting right now the data collection on, on these particular studies in terms of um, independence and accuracy. So we're just in the training phases um, instruction and we just started doing um, base, uh, baseline data, I mean, con intervention data. So we've collected the baseline, we've done, we're working on the training and students are at a different level and we're starting the intervention. Um, but yes, that's definitely one of the inherent features that can make virtual manipulas um, more appealing or more um, successful is the idea that they you don't necessarily have to exchange physically exchange yourself. They do come together and things like that. So it's one of the inherent things of the technology versus the concrete. What about in the initial studies that you showed us? Was there a feature like that? Oh yeah, with the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we did subtraction, so I just showed you how they kind of break apart. But in the National Library for addition, if you lasso them, you draw a circle or a square around them, then they do clip together and then you can move mm -hmm. them all. So the app and the NLVL, National Library of Virtual Manipulatives are very similar. So. Um, this one you had to, you still have, you, you have to place it. And if you, we tried it, you can't take the green ones, the top number, and bring them down to the, right, the bottom numbers. You have to bring the bottom numbers up like you're, and things like that. Um, you have to put them in order. They have to click in together. There can't be more than 10. It's not going to form together if there's just nine. It won't, you know, it won't let you form with 11. Um, same thing with the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. You, you can test it out. You have to just get 10 in your last. So you can't get 10 and a half, part of another one, to get it to form into that 10. So, so it makes me wonder the differences between the concrete and the virtual, like where there was a discrepancy in the accuracy, was, that, was it attributed by the feature of the virtual mm -hmm. manipulative? Yeah, so we didn't have any discrepancy in accuracy. All the students were accurate. The, the discrepancies came in the for independence. Both? Yes, for oh, both. Okay. Yeah, I can oh. see the top. I see. Yeah. yeah, so this is, a, so they, there wasn't that discrepancy in accuracy. It was just independence. The independence. And they were more independent with the virtual, which would go to the point that you're making, right? Mm -hmm. um, is that it, it clicked together versus having them to physically exchange, mm -hmm. right? And that's again, so if we're talking about independence being a big deal for students, then that is some support for the virtual manipulatives, is that it does create inherent. Um, independence because you don't have to do some of that physical exchange you don't have to be prompted to remember to exchange it does kind of snap that kind of those blocks together into a tens block for you and I guess that's related to my other question and that is with the the prompting and the independence sometimes there's multiple prompting mm -hmm. that that can be done so are you looking it seems like later in the current work you had kind of more of a almost like a well, how you were collecting the data with the different levels of prompting? We did the same thing in that, this study, too. Okay, yes. so, but this just, is this, is this, this is just the percent of, no percent of all, this is the, um, across, so this would be like, across this session, what percent of all steps were independent, you know, the, across the whole session. So, in this, they say so there was 70% independent. So, 30% of the steps across that session. So, if there's five problems, and the task analysis is, you know, let's say 10 items, right, um, that's 50. So 30% of those items, they needed to be prompted. Well, but do you, do you look at repeated prompting? Well, yeah, so that would mean, yes, that we, yes, the idea that, that they Is need that a included? gesture. Yeah, it, we talked about that. Mo all these students were all successful at the gesture, so we didn't have to go into further prompting. Like, we were able to do gesture. We didn't have to go, they were, with just simply a gesture, they were responsive, and we were able to move on. So we didn't have to do some of the more de in depth. But when we do, we talk about this is the percent of steps that needed prompting, and then this is a type of prompting. So of the steps that needed prompting, you know, um, let's say 90% were gesture, 5% were indirect, you know, 5%, you know, 2% were direct, and what, you know, 3%, whatever's left, would be modeling. And so we talk about what 
what, what actual steps have to be doing, and do we see a reduction? And so we can, we've actually been able to graph that or even talk about that. In the early, we see this modeling, and we see this decrease to just having to do gestures, to just having to go down to doing nothing. In this particular study, they were all able to do gestures and move on, so we didn't necessarily have to go into that more. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> I'm well, <coughs> interested in a lot of different things, but one of the things you talked about in that last study is going the in, to concrete, mm -hmm. to representational, and that step in between, or is it in between, or can it replace that first one? Do you have any, because we play with this a lot, uh, when we're doing this with volume and surface area. And to what extent do you have to actually feel it before you see this virtual manipulation that we mm -hmm. have, have what we have? And do you have any con any conjectures at this point? Well, I mean, or is it vary from one topic to the other and one manipulative to the other? Yeah, I mean, I think like what we found, at least when we were doing with base ten, which is where we've been dealing with con comparing concrete and virtual, is that they, I mean, they're actually in terms of accuracy similar, and, and in terms of independence, virtual is more effective. So to us, there could be that level of um, exchange, like that would be potentially a manipulative in which you could exchange. Um, in the algebraic balance scales, the students were, you know, successful. Um, again, they actually preferred the algebraic balance scale. There wasn't differences in accuracy and um, independence, and so that would be another one that you could exchange. I think it would be that you'd have to want to look at each particular um, manipulative to talk about it. Um, to think about, is, this, is there something inherent in this concrete manipulative that you can't get? And when you get to some of those more 3D ones, um, you know, have you, with the net, like looking at um, surface area and volume in the cubes, you know, I've done that, and you get that rotation. And so there is some benefit that you can do, you can see all the sides and rotate it versus, you know, I, sometimes with the kids and you're like, well, I can't see that, it's on the table, and getting them to understand that. There is some of that benefit in the virtual one of being able to do that, you know, 360 rotation. Even um, at a simple level, the graphing, you know, I think we, we advocate some paper pencil graphing mm -hmm. just so people can get feeling for what, are, you know, what it's doing here over and up or over and up. But then quickly move to the, uh, and I would assume the same thing would be true for special needs students. We think this is true for all students, most students. Right, and that's why, mm -hmm. yes. And there's something about this actually doing up and over that provides some kind of connection with that. Oh yeah, when I talk about accommodations and you know a lot of our students can struggle with fine motor or those graph things, I always say you need to, when you think about accommodations, they need to have the heart of the mathematics. So if the mathematics lesson is actually teaching them to graph, don't take away that. You can't over accommodate that. They have to do that even if they struggle. And then once they've shown that they can do that, then you can move on. But um, a lot when we think about accommodations, you can't take away the heart of the mathematics. That's a big <laughs> and then one last unanswerable yeah. question. <laughs> To what extent, like in, the, in your study with learning just <coughs> kids with special needs, you've done these small studies with kids mm -hmm. three. To what, how come would you feel generalizing this to? And again, special needs has got the same kind of spectrum right. that autism has. Right, I mean, so that's one of the things with, um, you know, single subjects. We don't think about generalization, but what we do is we think if there is, you know, what you can do is talk about something being evidence-based, but you have a sufficient number. So if we gather a sufficient number of studies on virtual manipulatives or virtual manipulatives with base 10 blocks and things like that, and then we meet the quality indicators, then we can talk about these being an evidence-based practice, and then that's where some of that generalizability comes in. Um, but yes, I mean, ideally this would be great. Um, the research on students in general, students without disabilities in virtual manipulatives has been more experimental or primarily quasi-experimental. Um, the problem is getting enough students um, in similar contexts that are at similar levels to be able to do some of those um, quasi-experimental or, you know, um, experimental designs that are not single subject. That seems to be some of the challenge, particularly when you're talking about students with autism. Obviously, it'd be a little bit easier with students with learning disabilities, but um, yes, if I could find enough people, I would, I would <laughs> love to move into that. Did you have questions, Tom? No. So, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Emily for a really, really interesting uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. And don't forget on your way out, there's a sign-in sheet. We just like to keep track of the tent.